Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome um, to the first meeting of the commission that was established in this past legislative session. Uh, the main purpose for this particular commission is to study and take a look at the entire uh, transportation system and infrastructure system in the state of Rhode Island. Today, we will be having a presentation from our staff to give us an overview of what has been looked at in the past and what we can continue to work on in the next uh, several days. I just introduce everyone here. To my left, we have uh, the Chairman of House Finance, Senator Daniel DuPont. Uh, to his left is uh, Senator Lou De Palmer. To my right is uh, Representative uh, Jay Edwards and Senator Arriuano and uh, Representative Gia Russo. We also have on this commission um, a representative from the Rhode Island Bridge and Turnpike Authority, Buddy Croft. We have a representative from the Department of Administration, Peter Marino, and the Director of Transportation from the, the Department of Transportation, uh, Michael Lewis. So at this time, uh, without further ado, I'd like to sure I'd like to turn it over Senator DuPont for any other comments. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Thank you to all who are uh, participating. Uh, I just wanted to, to add before we uh, begin this um, this process that uh, what would be you know helpful and, and particularly in future meetings, uh, we've certainly heard a great deal uh, during the past legislative session and in previous legislative sessions. Uh, with various uh, proposals that have been made of what we should not do or what we cannot do. Uh, but it would be helpful and I think much more productive as we progress and move forward uh, on actually uh, hearing what we can do or what we should consider doing. Uh, the challenge is obviously very significant. We all know that. Uh, there is no, I don't believe there's a silver bullet solution. Uh, but what I think would be very helpful to coming up with an ultimate uh, solution would be uh, some positive suggestions as to what we can do and not, uh, again, what we can't or should not do. Uh, and so I'd also just like to uh, mention uh, in the uh, back of the room here, uh, Senator Felag, uh, who's also uh, joining us uh, as well. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, and we will move right over to uh, the people making the presenta presentation today. Uh, we have Sharon, Sharon Reynolds Ferlin who will be uh, going through today's presentation. Good afternoon, Sharon, and welcome. Thank you, Chairman and um, members of the Commission. Uh, as you have asked us to do, um, we've sort of attempted to lay the groundwork for the work you'll be doing over the next few months. Um, and uh, in a moment, I'll take you through the binder of information in front of you. Uh, as you mentioned, the, the commission was established uh, at the close of the last session, and the mission is to make a comprehensive study of all types of equitable and reliable funding mechanisms and or strategies to support Rhode Island's infrastructure. Now, this commission did arise from the specific concern raised about tolls that were imposed on the new Sakonet River Bridge, and the commission's findings are due by January 15th of next year slide just goes over the Commission membership. Our presentation to you today is simply designed to give an overview of the issue and bring together the existing <coughs> resources and reports that have been fairly exhaustive on this topic, related topics. Um, the documents before you um, and additional resources will be available on the General Assembly's website. There will be links to the uh, Commission hearings. So anyone wanting to have what you have will be able to have that. Uh, I d the link is not up as of yet, but it will be very shortly. So the things that we weren't really, from a practical point of view, able to produce and hand to you is accessible, uh, will be accessible on the web. Um, I'll take a moment just to kind of tell you what's in the documents before you. There is a list after the table of contents tab. and a host of reports have been done in the last five or so years. We kind of only went back about five years, um, lest we give you volumes. Uh, so you have the um, Blue Ribbon Panel on Transportation report. 
you have a number of documents that give you state-by-state -state comparisons of things such as funding mechanisms, proposed legislation, things that have passed, things that have failed. Um, there are um, also things, uh, prior reports that have been done, uh, in particular uh, the Senate had a special commission in 2011, so the, that report is reproduced here. It covers a number of the same issues. Many of them have not changed. It is still a valid and helpful report. It also recaps a number of the other reports that were done. So what we're, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. We're trying to bring to you in one place the host of information, the work that's been done by some of you sitting up here now and some of people interested in here. The, they're not necessarily new issues, so the attempt today is to bring everybody up to the kind of the same knowledge level on, on the comprehensive topic so that as you move forward, you're able to, as Chairman DuPont mentioned, sort of discuss solutions from the same knowledge base. Um, so there's 11 different uh, tabs here with the reports I've mentioned. As we go through the PowerPoint, we'll try to reference them. There are some that were just far too large to hand to you. They'll be on the website only. They're listed on the second page of the table of contents. If any of you have reports that we've missed that you find useful and you think members should have, I'm happy to uh, get those posted and, and out to people um, so that everybody, again, it's not meant to be exhaustive, uh, but it's meant to sort of pull from some of the things that we found useful as we looked at this and again many of you have participated in these commissions in the past. Um, so um, the presentation here is really just an overview of transportation agencies and how their work is funded. Uh, an attempt to get at the current state of Rhode Island's infrastructure um, through rankings and some, some dollar amounts. Um, a little discussion of the recent initiatives and alternate approaches, some of which are also covered in the, the long version of the material here. And then just to touch quickly on some economic considerations. Um, and now I'd like JP to do all the heavy lifting and take you through the, the details. Uh, and I'll be back to, to help answer any questions and wrap it up. Thank you, Sharon, for that. And uh, <laughs> thank you, Chairman, members of the Commission. Um, I will be doing a, a brief overview, as Sharon had mentioned, uh, beginning with just a quick snapshot of the state as a whole. Uh, highways, roads, and bridges, of course, uh, under the auspices of DOT, Turnpike and Bridge Authority. Uh, transit, RIPTA, and airports, uh, of course, TF Green and the General Aviation Airports. So get into uh, DOT briefly, the lead state agency for infrastructure creation and maintenance. Uh, as we go through this process, they will be an agency we reflect a lot on uh, due to their involvement. Uh, as you know, they work closely with the statewide planning division to develop the state's transportation improvement program. This will also be something we reference. Um, that is referred to as the TIP oftentimes. Um, and that program includes multiple transportation elements. So you're talking highways, roads, bridges, uh, down to pedestrian, bike path, things like that. Department of Transportation is charged with maintaining the property and infrastructure throughout the state. This goes down to the level of uh, litter, graffiti removal, all the way up to snow plowing, winter maintenance. Uh, just to give you a, a scope here, we're talking approximately 1,100 road miles or about 3,000 lane miles that they're responsible for. So the snapshot of the uh, previous year's budget, FY13 budget, $465.8 million. They are authorized to 772.6 positions. Um, won't go through all of them, but as you can see here, federal funds, over $300 million, major source of revenue for the department, followed by a uh, gasoline tax, which will also take you through in a little more detail later on, uh, approximately $90 million a year. And this slide here just kind of graphically breaks that out for you. As you can see, again, largest slice of the pie, those federal funds, almost 70% of the department's budget. And now I, um, a little bit on Turnpike and Bridge Authority. Now, this is a quasi-public agency. It's created back in 1954, governed by five-member board of directors. They are responsible for the maintenance and operations of Newport Pell, Mount Hope, Jamestown, Verrazano, and the Sakana River Bridge. Uh, they have a full-time staff of 33 right now. Uh, that does fluctuate sometimes with part-time and casual staff as needed. 
And um, just so you know, the authority is constantly updating a 10-year rolling capital plan. Um, in 2007, it became evident that the sources available to the authority would be insufficient for all the capital repairs uh, under the bridges under their control at that time. Uh, so what they did was commission traffic and revenue analysis and a needs determination um, and also revised toll structure. This plan takes place from FY 2009 through FY 19, the one we're referencing now. Over that 10-year period, it appeared to be a funding gap, approximately 200 million. Uh, this consisted of about 160 million on the new Port Pell and almost 50 million on the Mount Hope Bridge. Now, in March of 2008, the authority had come in, uh, presented before this committee, also held a number of public meetings the following year, uh, worked with some consultants, looked at their options, eventually uh, ended up raising the toll on the Newport Bridge from $2 to $4 a crossing. Uh, that had not been raised since, I believe, 1960, uh, so that was the first time that was increased. And then following that, Institute an Easy Pass system on there, um, and then the Rhode Island Easy Pass owners pay 83 cents per crossing, while the uh, cash fare remains at $4 per crossing. Now, it should just be noted that the Assembly does not approve the actual toll changes. Uh, however, they do approve borrowing uh, for the authority. Those, uh, the borrowing the authority carries out uh, is revenue bonds. Those bonds are backed by the toll revenue. And just to give you a brief history on what's been approved uh, in recent years, 09, the Assembly approved 50 million of revenue bonds. 2010, Assembly approved an additional 68 million. And the next major piece of legislation involving the authority, as you're aware, is the uh, transfer of the ownership and res maintenance responsibilities of both Sakana and Jamestown uh, to the authority. Uh, when the authority was given those responsibilities, um, had to rearrange a little bit and plan to put tolls on Sakana at the end of July 2013. That toll structure was going to be all electronic tolling, no uh, booths there. Um, the toll structure is before you, 75 cents each way with the Rhode Island Easy Pass, up to $5.25 each way with uh, no Easy Pass. And just so you know that that $5.25, $1.50 of that is a um, uh, electronic you know, transfer fee, um, you know, not part of the toll itself. 2013 Assembly did make some uh, changes to this delayed the institution of the authority's toll and instead uh, basically put a toll not to exceed 10 cents from August 19th through April 1st of 2014. That toll amount was put in place as a placeholder, um, as many of you are aware, to uh, fulfill a federal requirement which requires that a toll be, on, be in place on the bridge before the bridge is substantially completed. And then just to wrap up a little bit on Turnpike and Bridge Authority, give you a, a little bit of what they do. FY13 operating budget approaches uh, almost 19 million, and it's basically all toll revenue um, that makes up those sources. Continuing uh, with the rest of transportation throughout the state, we have the Rhode Island Public Transit Authority, also a quasi-state agency. Uh, this is governed by an eight-member board of directors. They're responsible for the fixed route bus service, um, American with Disabilities Act, and paratransit service operations. They are responsible for approximately 1,400 square miles, doing about 3,300 daily trips uh, with 54 fixed routes statewide. They are budgeted for 826 positions. They currently have less than that filled. And they are mostly union, however, there are 25 of those employees that are non-union. Give you a scope of their operating budget, approximately $100 million in the most recent year. Um, one of their largest sources, again, gasoline tax, passenger revenue makes up approximately $24 million. Uh, another large chunk of that money is the federal funds as well as some other sources. Um, it should also be noted here that the uh, Public Transit Authority is receiving RICAP through the Department of Transportation, and uh, the last year's assembly also authorized the state to pick up some of the uh, debt service costs borne by the authority for uh, FY 13 and 14 only. 
And finally, we have the Airport Corporation, again, quasi-state agency, uh, responsible for TF Green and the five general aviation airports. They do not receive state funding. They currently have approximately 150 positions. Similar to the Turnpike and Bridge Authority, uh, they are required to seek assembly approval for borrowing. Um, and right now, the, the large borrowing that will be going on for them is going to be the expansion uh, of the main runway at TF Green. Their operating budget for the last year is almost $50 million. This was made up of a variety of sources, uh, mainly from fares and passenger fees. Uh, they receive a small amount of federal sources and also enterprise funds. The, um, oh, you actually, you know, in order to point that out a little better for you, if you want to look at the tab 11 in your books to follow along on any of the revenue sources, that will show you uh, what's there for the airport corporation. Those sources are uh, made up of a variety of things. So in this presentation here, we kind of summarized them, grouped them together. But if you wanted to see the, uh, the individual smaller sources and how they're made up, that's uh, located in that tab. Now, one of the uh, major fund sources for all transportation in the state, the uh, Department of Transportation receives these from the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, those funds are funded from the federal gas tax. Uh, that is currently 18.4 cents a gallon. Um, generally, what happens is the, uh, in order to get those federal funds, the state puts up a 20 percent match. Um, for a pretty good amount of the last uh, bit of history here, the state had been borrowing funds to cover that 20 percent match. And those funds get funneled into the Transportation Improvement Plan, which is the, uh, the statewide plan. It's a four-year plan uh, that is developed by a variety of transportation entities, um, involves state, municipal, federal as well. Local stakeholders are involved. And there is uh, additional information, again, in, your, uh, in the longer version of the report that we have included. However, this is a, just a very quick breakdown of the TIP process, um, but it does give you some scale as to how long this process takes. Uh, just the internal preparation can take up to nine months. Uh, proposals are submitted uh, over a couple month period. Drafts are made. There's a time for review and comment and eventual adoption. Um, this is a continuous process, and again, uh, there's a section of this in the report that will give you a little more detail as to how this works. And that uh, program is going to fund your federal highway projects, your, the big stuff, uh, construction and repair of highways, roads, bridges, uh, safety improvements, resurfacing, things like that. Um, another fund source we've seen over the years for transportation was uh, back in 2009 with the Stimulus Act. Um, that allotted over $160 million to transportation projects, uh, $24 million for RIPTA. And, you know, that is being phased out, but it was a, a large part. Did kickstart some projects, allowed the Department of Transportation to, to move forward some projects that were already in design and were just, you know, basically awaiting funding. So. I uh, wanted to include that, however, you, know, you should know that the majority of those funds uh, will be spent by the end of the current fiscal year. Uh, there's also other federal funds that make up the department sources, um, grant funding, for example, from the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, uh, also funding in there for commuter rail from the Federal Transit Authority. Now, one of the sources we'll pay a little more attention to in some of our information is the gasoline tax. Overall, for the state, generates approximately $135 million a year. That $135 million is derived from the $0.33 cent per gallon tax uh, on gasoline sold in the state. Those funds are deposited into the Intermodal Surface Transportation Fund and distributed according to statute. Uh, the slide before you now breaks out that distribution of the 33 cents. As you can see, uh, Department of Transportation and Public Transit Authority get the majority of them, 21.75 for the department, 9.75 cents for the authority. Now, overall, in our state and on the federal level and in many other states, the gasoline tax is a declining source. It's restricted due to its availability. 
Um, a lot of times it is not available in our state for use due to the increasing debt service costs uh, that have piled up over the years due to the borrowing that the state has done on behalf of DOT to get that 20% match I had mentioned before. Of course, this makes less of those funds available for the actual day-to-day -day operations, can impact uh, you know, the amount of personnel available, also has an impact on the assets themselves. Uh, and you can see this anywhere from litter removal to um, you know, winter maintenance, things like that, are all funded with this gasoline tax source. So as those aren't available, less can be done. As I mentioned before, this tax on gasoline is assessed both the federal and state level. It is levied on a per gallon basis. And if you look over the last few years, and again, we expand on this a little bit in the report and give you um, some history going back multiple years in order to basically see uh, the amount of the gasoline tax yield has gone down. Um, basically, you know, round numbers back five or six years ago, you would see that the gasoline tax could yield 4.8 million a penny. Whereas if you look at the current year estimate, which is actually represents a slight uptick, but still proves the point, it's about 4.2 million. So you're looking at just, it, you know, without even including inflation, you're already down almost $700,000 just on a per penny basis. And that is linked to the consumption of the gasoline itself. Now again, the federal gasoline tax is separate, is on top of the 33 cents. That's an 18.4 cent gas tax. That has not changed since 1993. That is levied on the federal level. Um, those revenues are deposited into the federal Highway Transportation Trust Fund and then is allocated down to the states. Now some states, because of the problems in either their state and or with the federal gas tax and their allotment have decided to change their gas tax. What this slide before you now shows is some states that have increased their gas tax in the last eight year, uh, actually in the last legislative session. So as you can see, it's eight states that had done it. Um, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont are right there. Average change was about four cents. We had a very, very small change of less than a tenth of a cent. We can get into that later too. Uh, it's also contained in the report, some of the backup information as to why you would see such a small change. It's due to the way they are indexed. Uh, however, as you can see, Wyoming had a 10 cent gas tax increase, but at the same time they were at 14% compared to some other states of California that was already at 50 cents. Now, uh, to look at this regionally, you can see Rhode Island at 33 cents is a um, substantial amount below Connecticut um, and just slightly above the New England average of 32 cents. National average, 31.1 cents. Um, Massachusetts is at 26.5. Uh, they recently raised their gas tax just this last session as well. Now, with the problems of the gasoline tax, that has happened over years. Um, People have seen these things happening and wanted to do some things to try and reduce the negative impact of the de decline in the gasoline tax. So one of the things the assembly had looked at was trying to transition transportation in general uh, from a financing strategy to more of a pay-go strategy. Approached that two different ways. One was to create new sources in general. So. Uh, the assembly had added some new motor vehicle surcharges and also allocated Rhode Island capital plan funds. A second uh, approach to that was to lower the current obligations of the department. So by using this two-pronged approach, there was an attempt to make a, a good impact both early on and in the later years as far as decreasing this. Uh, these are also included in your uh, report that we handed out to you. It shows you the restructuring of the department's debt uh, that was uh, began two years ago. So that funding was carried out in two ways, as I mentioned. Uh, the additional surcharge revenue uh, was began to be collected in the current year. That is estimated to yield up to $20 million annually. Uh, that's combined with approximately $20 million Rhode Island Capital Plan funds. That gives you your $40 million um, in your singular year. And this slide here just shows you those fees and what the change were um, and how they'll be phased in. So 
$10 increases on your registration fee, uh, $5 on the uh, annual registration fee and the license fee, $10 a year for three years. And again, that gives you your 20% match as opposed to borrowing. So it, it does replace future borrowing. However, the impact on the current debt service obligation isn't great at the moment. However, it's a, a structural change that will help in the future. And what this slide here shows you is how that $40 million is generated every year. And as you'll notice, the, the la most recent ballot did not include a transportation referenda. In the past, it had been $80 million, And what that did was give you your $40 million a year, which matched the federal funds. What this does now is replace that borrowing with this $40 million. So this slide here just shows you how the phased-in surcharges, along with the RICAP, combines to get you that $40 million. Um, there are some other vehicle-related fees that uh, have been in the discussion as well. Revenues from uh, operator license issuances, renewals, vehicle registrations. These are all uh, transportation-related fees that are collected by the DMV. Uh, generates approximately $40 million annually. These are deposited as general revenues. And there have been previous proposals to take these and put them into transportation-related activities. Uh, more general revenues and Rhode Island Capital Plan funds have been dedicated to transportation in the last few years. And because they are derived from general revenues, um, it is a portion of these related fees are, in effect, being used to support transportation as a whole. So although it may not be a, a direct general revenue appropriation for those, uh, it's basically the same pot of money. It is going to transportation just in a, a different way. Um, and also, just the, some of the materials you have include tables showing how other states fund their infrastructure. What we did was to create a matrix showing you which, um, which sources are used, which strategies are used uh, throughout the whole country. So you have that in there for every state. Um, and you can see in those sources that gas tax is a major component. Uh, however, it's being supplemented with a variety of different sources. Um, to an increasing degree, they face similar problems. So it's something that you're seeing throughout all the other states as well. And by uh, looking into some of the tables we provided, you can see some states, are, you know, they're also looking for alternative sources, and they're described in the report. This next section of the uh, presentation will attempt to uh, explain a little bit of where we're at um, as a state with our infrastructure. Table before you now, um, just quick breakdown, bridge statistics. As you can see, about 763 bridges on the National Bridge Inventory. Of that amount, 21 rough percent are structurally deficient, almost 30 functionally obsolete, uh, weight restricted 12.5%, uh, almost 2% bridges closed, um, and then almost 36% uh, in fair condition. Just to give you a little background on what, what those terms mean, uh, determination of structural deficiency uses a rating scale of between 0 and 9, 9 being excellent, 0 being failed. So uh, during these inspections and to rate these bridges, they look at three components, the deck or the riding surface, the superstructure, which is the support immediately beneath that surface, and then the substructure, that would be the foundation and your supporting posts and piers. If any of these components are ranked at a four or less, the bridge is considered structurally deficient. So as we're going through these and you see what the numbers are, it's important to note where those definitions are derived from and how they're arrived at. A deficient bridge typically requires maintenance repair. Uh, you're going to eventually need to rehabilitate that or replace it to address those deficiencies. It's, it's usually something significant. Um, in order to remain open to traffic, some of those structurally deficient bridges are often posted and have reduced weight limits. That usually go, uh, goes after the uh, gross weight of the vehicles. Uh, these account for the uh, weight-restricted category, so approximately 12% of the bridges throughout the state on that national bridge inventory. Uh, if unsafe conditions are identified during a physical inspection of that bridge, then, the, then we talk about the structure being closed. 
Um, it has been around 12 for recent memory, right around that number for uh, closed bridges, which is less than 2% of all bridges statewide. Now, just to give you a, a snapshot of the geographical disbursement of the issue, um, as you can see here, Providence County, with an overwhelming majority of those bridges, uh, almost 63% structurally deficient, followed by Washington County, then Kent, uh, Bristol, with a, just over 1%. Now, continuing with um, the state of our infrastructure, there have been several reports released, and this report is also included. Um, this was a report done by the Reason Foundation. It's been cited in other reports, um, I believe also in the one the, the Senate had done a couple of years ago. And basically, this starts to get at where does Rhode Island stack up uh, compared to other states. Overall, uh, in that report, Rhode Island was ranked at the bottom. Um, and it was based on a few different factors. Um, money spent per mile was one of the biggest ones. Uh, you know, capital disbursements per each mile of road. Same for uh, how much it costs to maintain those miles of road, what the administrative costs per mile of those roads are. So as you can see from those numbers, what we did was just put um, the amount reported in that study, put it next to the national average to give you uh, a comparison. Another section we look at when we're trying to find the scope of the problem is the, the pavement condition throughout the state. Uh, it ranges from excellent to poor, and this slide here just gives you a, a slight indication of how those are ranked. It is not very technical on this slide. There is some more technical information we'll provide for you. But uh, it should be noted nearly 60% of the pavement in the state is classified as failed or in poor condition. Another issue uh, that the department has started to address recently and has come up more in the last few years is the drainage. Um, approximately 25,000 catch basins throughout the state. Currently, the department's only able to address about 1,000 a year. This improper drainage can lead to multiple problems. It can exacerbate the problems already on the roads themselves as far as maintaining them and also include safety hazards in a, a rain event. So with those problems being stated, the department, along with some others, have estimated the funding need to address these issues. First and foremost was the Bridges. Bridge Rehabilitation Program currently is at $322.2 million. That is in the department's current capital budget request. That is for our five-year bridge program. The objective of that is to bring the number of state bridges in poor condition below 10 percent. This is a in coordination with federal guidelines that have come out in the most recent federal authorization. And under this current plan, this would address approximately 200 bridges, uh, and 71 bridges rated as poor would be repaired, with the uh, emphasis being that we could approach some of these bridges before they get to the structurally deficient stage, as stated by the department in its request. Um, this would improve 130 bridges currently rated as fair, now, these are the bridges that are not immediately at risk. Uh, however, again, the goal uh, would be to prevent them from falling into worse repair. Currently, as the previous slide had showed, about 21% of the state's bridges are poor. Department predicts that without additional funding, this percentage could increase to over 40% um, by FY 2020. Now, the resurfacing uh, issues would be addressed by the department with $125 million over five years. This funding would be used to expand the current resurfacing projects uh, and, again, to increase the proportion of roads that are in good condition. And another large project uh, in the department's horizon is the reconstruction of Route 6 and 10. This is a, a very large-scale infrastructure project, currently estimated $480 million. Uh, there are 11 bridges on that structure. As of now, eight are more than 60 years old. Um, in discussions with the Federal Highway Administration, the department had noted that they are no longer willing to use those funds that they would uh, grant to the state to do a short-term repairs on that infrastructure. Um, as they believe that this should be a long-term solution and should, that should be a high priority for the state. 
So looking at those three projects here, if you can combine them all into one snapshot, um, approximately $928 million over five years is the scope of the problem that um, the need that actually has been identified by the department. Uh, as you can see, about $146 million in the uh, upcoming budget year, followed by uh, over $200 million in the next few years, then going back down a little in FY 2019. But overall, the uh, order of magnitude for the problem, $928 million. Now, uh, as the statement of need does not include the funding needed for the uh, Providence Viaduct, which is another large-scale infrastructure project that uh, the department has addressed. And currently, those projects that I previously described as well as this uh, are lacking any fund sources. So they are, they're currently not funded with um, any dollars. And what it also will address in the report is that there is uncertainty not only on the state as to how those problems will be addressed, but also on the federal level. Um, as the Federal Highway Trust Fund is experiencing some issues too, that is expected to be insolvent with, uh, I believe, in another two years or so. So there is some one year, one year or so um, for that. So uh, there's basically a combination of uncertainty on the federal side as well as a, a lack of a, a plan currently on how to address that infrastructure. And this uh, next part here will just summarize some of the recent transportation initiatives that have been undertaken. Uh, starting with the Blue Ribbon Panel back in 2008, uh, they had a mission to uh, basically, it was one of the first attempts to explain the entire need for the state. Uh, they did assess funding options, they looked at uh, the statement of need, and then tried to get at some of the funding mechanisms that uh, might be able to help that situation out. Some of the major themes that were brought out by that panel included the ineffectiveness of the gasoline tax funding, the lack of dedicated funding sources overall, and uh, possible operating inefficiencies of the agencies involved in transportation. At that time, it was determined DOT required approximately $300 million per year of additional funding over a 10-year period, and that was a, a minimal amount, a amount to bring uh, infrastructure into a, a state of fair or good repair. It wasn't something that would yeah, make the state by any means uh, ahead of the curve. Uh, the recommendations from that panel included a cafeteria style list of options. Uh, some of these will look very familiar to you. Tolling Interstate 95, increasing gasoline tax, redirecting current revenue streams, transferring the ownership of state maintained bridges to Turnpike and Bridge Authority and establishing surcharges for transportation-related uh, DMV fees. And this was back again in 2008. As you are aware, most of these recommendations have been adopted, uh, at least in some part. Uh, one that, of course, has not been adopted was the tolling of Interstate 95, as the initial application for that was denied by the federal partners. Now, as far as stimulus funding, the DOT was able to advance numerous projects. Um, also, we got, uh, as a state, the state was awarded additional funds for commuter rail projects. Stimulus funds added approximately $140 million of funding for those infrastructure projects. There was an additional 20-some-odd million for RIPTA. Uh, however, it didn't address the long-term problems related to the state's infrastructure funding. So while it was a, a, an injection at the time, it didn't do anything to get at the structural issue. Some things that were done to try and uh, help structural issues were the, uh, some changes to the gas tax. In 2009, the assembly transferred one cent that was currently being dedicated to the general fund. That was the last cent that was going anywhere that wasn't transportation related. That was shifted over to DOT. Uh, and in that same year, the assembly directed half of uh, one cent, which was going to the underground storage tank fund, and redirected that half cent to the public transit authority. Uh, 2009 assembly also raised the gas tax by two cents and gave those two cents to the authority. So before those changes, looking at the transport, uh, transit authority, uh, 7.25 cents after 9.75 cents of the gasoline tax. Uh, at that time, Senate completed a commission to uh, study the sustainable transportation funding back 2011. That report uh, is also included in your packet. 
Some more changes that were made, 2012 Assembly identified and addressed two major issues, as I had touched on before, the over-reliance on debt uh, and the limited amount of funding sources. And the state moved from its financing model to a pay-go model, established the motor vehicle fee surcharges to be transferred to a trust fund. Uh, those funds are used as a portion of the state's match for federal funds, which I explained previously. Um, and again, those funds combined with the ride cap uh, gives the state its annual match of 40 million. And again, previously, this was all generated through issuing debt. Um, further, the uh, state reduced the amount of debt service paid by the Department of Transportation uh, through the use of general revenues. Uh, typically, the department had to use its gasoline tax revenues, sometimes 35, 40, 45 million dollars annually, uh, which is basically almost half of their entire allotment would go towards uh, debt service. Uh, instead, the state looked at the debt as a whole, restructured the debt, it was, uh, you know, similar to a refinancing. Um, and what that did was to level out those payments so they weren't jumping around so much from 30 to 40 to 50 million a year. And uh, along with that debt restructuring, uh, the state appropriated $10 million of general revenues to be used to pay a portion of the department's debt service. That's began in uh, the current year, FY 2014. And the general revenue will be increased in $10 million increments uh, from FY 2014 on. Uh, these changes in the debt restructuring can be found on page 14 of the report uh, we included with your material. And what that shows you is the outstanding debt of the department and takes it down to when that debt will uh, all be taken up by general revenues and the department will be no longer um, on the hook for any of the debt service, which is projected to be in fiscal year 2018. So by then, the department sources should not be going towards the debt service on the general obligation bonds. It will be shifted to general revenue. Some other changes, the 2012 Assembly also established a new Office of Management and Budget. Uh, along with that established office, they included some legislation requiring the office to perform a special study on the transportation function. Uh, the office is currently finalizing that report. And we did get an original report from them back in December of 2012, uh, which was the first part of their report. That is also included in your material uh, under tab 5. And that breaks down a lot of information we've given you here today as far as um, overviews, what other states do, um, different options that are out there, and uh, basically how other states run their transportation programs. So that information is included in that report. Um, we won't repeat too much of that here, but that information is out there. Um, also, another change was the uh, Article 20 in that 2012 budget. Uh, that transferred the ownership of the Sakonet Bridge and the Jamestown Bridge from the Department of Transportation to the Turnpike and Bridge Authority. That was followed up the uh, following year with the uh, previous Assembly's creation of the Municipal Road and Bridge Revolving Fund, another a new transportation initiative taken up last year. Just to remind you, that is um, a fund that be administered by the Clean Water Finance Agency. That will allow municipalities to borrow from that to complete large-scale road and bridge projects. The purpose of that being municipalities will be able to get a uh, you know, lower interest rate or cheaper borrowing than they could on their own by going through the Clean Water Finance Agency. Currently, that fund has $6.9 million in there. Uh, the intent uh, with that was to dedicate future premiums and other resources to that fund, so that $6.9 million will eventually grow over time. Uh, and that will become a revolving fund for the municipalities to be able to go and borrow from. Um, and just so you know, annual disbursements from that fund would not exceed $20 million once it does uh, reach a higher amount, and no more than 50% of available funding would be given to any one city or town, uh, and that is, of course, unless there are no other available projects um, to be completed. Uh, last few slides here, just uh, this information is also in your materials. Uh, it looks at, again, other states. Uh, a lot of states have been addressing transportation issues. This has been pretty consistent since uh, going back to 2007, 2008. 
Um, we have proposed legislation across the country it's summarized for you uh, just in order to show you what has passed, what has failed, um, what other states basically are thinking about. And that can be found in one of the tabs <laughs> towards the back, 10. Um, much of this we did get from the National Conference State Legislatures, NCSL. Uh, they have various uh, informational kind of databases that you can generate this information from. So by going through them state by state, we found out what the other states were doing again and then just summarize that. That coincides with um, some state profiles that are also included in your materials, and that's on tab two. Um, and basically what you can do is you can look at those state by state uh, in the matrix. You can pick any state you want. You can go across and see every source they use, the strategies they use, and then for further explanation you can turn to a narrative in the state profile and it will give you exactly how those options are carried out. For instance, indexing a gas tax, um, simply put can't be, uh, you know, in a graph real easy. So it, it links to that and then that will give you some more explanation into those. Well, the last parts we want to touch on is economic considerations. Again, the Commission's charged to make a comprehensive study of all types of equitable and reliable funding mechanisms. Uh, to support Rhode Island's infrastructure. So with that charge, the economic considerations are very important. Um, as you know, poor infrastructure can off is often cited as an impediment to economic growth, and the transportation system does play an integral role in supporting the state's economy, overall quality of life. Uh, these economic considerations, when you consider the impact of imposing tolls, fees, or increased taxes, uh, or reducing expenditures in other areas. Um, there are specific payers, the state as a whole, that must also be looked at. Um, for instance, you know, as, as much as it's good to add to transportation infrastructure as a positive, a lot of times if you're redirecting that revenue from another source, uh, there's a negative to that as well. So keeping those things in mind um, when you do your economic considerations. Just to wrap up, certainly we're able to answer questions as most likely are some of the members of the panel as well. Um, the, I'll give you a couple of examples of some of the things other states are doing just to give you a sense of what you have in front of you, some of the innovative things. I believe Oregon is one of the first states to do a vehicle mile tax. They're doing a pilot program that's described in, in one of the documents you have. Virginia did a sort of a upended its gas tax the way it collects it from a per gallon tax to um, a price based tax. It also dedicated a bunch of other resources, but it fundamentally tried to attack that problem of it of the gallonage being a declining source um, and again as as j p mentioned throughout, these are all um, before you. And it's difficult to summarize everything. There's some narrative that kind of helps uh, put a little more around uh, the slides. And um, the chairman have envisioned, and, and they can certainly address it as well, that the next meetings would, would, with this foundation, sort of begin to specifically address first the East Bay Bridge issue itself, an opportunity for presentations from the affected parties and interest groups. Um, and then from there move on to some sort of structured discussions on possible solutions and then as you work towards some findings and potential recommendations. Um, and again, we're happy to try and answer any questions you have or figure out how to get the answers for you. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon, thank you very much. JP, once again, thank you very much for an outstanding presentation. Um, before I continue on, I would just like to recognize Representative Canario and Representative Gallison, uh, two colleagues of mine uh, from the East Bay who are also here with us. Um, Sharon, question, when w transportation funding started losing its funding through the gas, gasoline usage, obviously we've seen a drop in the use of gasoline over the past five years. Has there been any way where 
other than what we talked about today where the Department of Transportation has been able to um, see additional revenues coming to, to close that particular gap? So you're saying that with the drop in gas tax, what has come to take its place? Yes, if anything has, other than the things that we talked about today. Well, I know we've we, tried to do some things. Through your actions, you've, you've started to backstop some of the losses as you've said, okay, we'll dedicate this source, okay, use this. I mean, are they getting it from some additional source? No. Um, but not that we're aware of. <laughs> right. They've certainly, you know, spent a number of years describing the, <coughs> the, the issue of having something based on consumption, not price. You know, you saw over the 10-year period, 25% inflation. It, forget, even if it were just even, the buying power of that one cent lost 20, 25%. And, and there's not a great deal of... Um, with the exception of a num uh, some states that index their gasoline tax, because of course, if you're paying 33 cents on four dollars versus 33 cents on when it was two dollars, the tax is a much smaller proportion of your of your gas bill. Um, still, people find it difficult to raise those taxes, so they're stuck with these kind of. We'll look at the feds; it's, it's been 20 years. Um, there's not an inclination to raise those taxes, so you end up with a uh, declining pool. And no, there's it. It doesn't appear that they've been able to conjure up places. Any to other type of revenue from anywhere? Yeah. Um, so obviously, what we're seeing here, as far as the gasoline taxes over the years, in, in many factors, whether it be high unemployment or the economic situation we have, but also as cars become much more efficient and use less gas with the use of less gasoline, it actually calls for less revenue to the Department of Transportation. You will find in the documents before you that some states have attempted to get at the efficiency piece. In or, so if, if the notion is that the user pays and the gas tax was the way that the user pays um, at the federal level and at the state level, but you're driving, say, a hybrid or a totally electric car, you escape that. You may be doing something good for the environment, and, and people can battle out whether, you know, the two are, you know, how you want to balance those two. But some states have started to, and I believe it was Virginia, impose just a fee for hybrid or electric cars in an attempt to say, well, you're not paying at the pump, but you're wearing down the roads like everybody else. Um, so as those issues, the fuel efficiency issues, eat away at some of the collections. There are some states are attacking that in a different way. Okay. Well, thank you once again. And once again, I want to thank both of you for a fine presentation. I'd like to open it up now to uh, questions and comments from the committee. If anyone has any questions or comments. Um, I do. Yes. Representative Jay Russo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just have one question. Like, when did it get so bad? I mean, the recession's been on for about five years, and I can't say we can pinpoint that it was just because of a gasoline consumption issue. It seems like we, you know, it, is it more debt service? I mean, how did it crumble all at once? I mean, if I'm by looking at some of these things, I think I'm afraid to drive home on some of these bridges. So if, if there's any way of knowing, like, has this been going on a lot longer than just a recession? I'm sure there's a director on your commission who's dying to answer this question, but so at least since 2008, there's been some bells ringing on this one, and, and most likely before that, um, to the extent that you, if you look at this, at this chart, you can see that the decline has been continuous. Um, sometimes, you know, things happen over time, and the combination of the debt service costs kicking up at the same time the penny was declining was really just that terrible mix of circumstances that, that, that forced a certain amount of action, but as you can see with the sort of projected need, it might not be all the action that's necessary. Maybe we could have Director Lewis um, just add to some of the sure. things that we heard in today's presentation. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I, I too want to say to you both, great job. I mean, that, that is a fabulous summary of the situation um, that we're facing. I think, you know, there are a couple things I, I can add. It'll just bring us all down a little bit further. But, um, but I think that, you know, it, 
and you know, I have been here for five years now, but when Governor Chafee came in, it was a recognition with all, with many of you sitting here that we needed to do something to change the model because it was, it was trending the way that you're suggesting, Rep, and, and that's what many of the, the in, um, initiatives that went into place over the last couple of years have, have stemmed the, the bleeding, as we've talked about, and that's been a great thing. It was the most critical thing to do was stop this debt service reliance, um, and, and, you know, credit to the governor, credit to the legislature for, for stepping in with some difficult decisions on that. Um, there, there are a few, um, just to get it out on the table, um, the presentation identified, I think, 752 bridges, um, and that is true, but I just want to make everybody aware that's the federal definition of a bridge. A federal definition of a bridge is a, is a span greater than 20 feet. Um, if you have a hole in the ground that's 19 feet wide, it's still a hole in the ground. So there, there are about 300, uh, there's 1,148 bridges that are greater than five feet. So there's a little bit of a larger problem in addition to the federal identified um, bridges. So we can talk about that further. Um, but it just sort of increases the challenge a little bit. JP referenced the, the status of the Highway Trust Fund and that is something that we really all, as a as a nation, have to be aware of. Uh, I had the opportunity to testify before the Senate yesterday in D.C. Um, the Highway Trust Fund is programmed. The Congressional Budget Office has programmed that the Highway Trust Fund will reach a negative balance one year from now. What that means in 2015, unless additional revenues are brought in at a federal level, there will be zero federal disbursements to the states. So we'll drop from about 200 million a year to zero, um, unless something is done. But the shortfall in the Highway Trust Fund is about uh, the equivalent of um, $15 billion a year to just stay level funded. That's the order of magnitude of the, that the nation is facing. Um, and that's the equivalent of, uh, to fill that void is the equivalent of a 10 cent federal gas tax in value. That's what we're facing right now. Um, other than that, things are good. Well, thank you, Director. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> everything's good as long as that's done. Senator De Palma. Thank you, Chairman. Sharon and JP, excellent job with the, uh, all the information you presented, and you did a great job of presenting the information as well. With regards to the first, so I have two items. With regards to the charge for the commission, the actual, in the beginning and the end, where, where it's described, it's good, I think, we're looking at all infrastructure. I wasn't sure if the charge for the commission was Rhode Island Bridge infrastructure only. Based on, I know the language changed from the original budget, the amended budget, and then we had the trailer bill by Leader Mattiello and some of the, line 31, if I recall correctly, uh, that got modified and line 30, or deleted and line 32 got added. So is it in fact Rhode Island infrastructure and not just Rhode Island Bridge infrastructure? Correct. If you, we actually try to address that in the, just the opening um, uh, of, um, of the report in that although it's titled the East Bay funding, effectively um, when, when the, the item that passed with the budget was determined to have some issues with it that needed to be addressed, mm -hmm. the notion was, all right, if you're going to address this, then, then really, as you can see, Perhaps the issue is so much larger that, as you as you know, that that it's it's um it's meant to be. I concur there with regards to. And that so the language specifically reads what, what was inserted in the place of East Bay was Rhode Island's infrastructure. Okay. So. Thank you. It, it, you never actually ever see it written all out at once. We have to kind of. Right, you have to piecemeal the original budget, the amended <laughs> budget, and the article. And Mr. Chairman, if I may. If I could just pass this down, if I could, to the uh, commission. We can talk about it in the future, but as we, as we all have, I'm sure, looked at the situation of funding transportation. I know I have quite a bit over the summer, and some of the reports that are in here have been some excellent reports that NCSL has done or CSG or the 50-state comparison. And you mentioned what's happening in Oregon. Just about every state is addressing this one way, shape, or form. They all have this... I don't, think there's not, I don't think there's a state that doesn't have an issue with how they're going to address their infrastructure. Uh, but in looking at that and said, well, we know there's a problem, and you, you pre, uh, JP talked to, and, and it'd be nice to see at some point what the 10-year numbers are and to see this over time, because 
we're not going to fix this in one year, right? We won't fix this in five years. We're probably not going to fix this in 10 years. Just thinking about it at a more macro level, whether it's 10, 15, or 20 years to get there from here, I don't know what that plan is, but I think it'd be worthwhile and maybe through what the directors already put together on the list of the 700 bridges and looking at their uh, rating of uh, structurally deficient or op uh, functionally obsolete or whatever that case is, it'd be valuable to have to identify ultimately, that identifies the need. So here's the input side, or one of the inputs, the need. The other input then becomes what are the sources of funding? And not to talk about any sources of funding, but I'd ask the commission, there's a, on the paper in front of you, and I, I'll get you a copy of Sharon and JP, and you can get it on, online as well if that makes sense. The 12 different criteria I think we should at least be looking at, I'm not gonna go through them now, that at the end of the day, whatever alternative we look at, we can look at through the lens of what these criteria are. And just, just from a couple, but I'm not gonna go through them all, things that talk to fairness and equity. Things that talk to something that's diversified. Another one with regards to long term, right? We're not necessarily gonna look for a source of funding that here it is, and then over time, in the case of, if we were doing gas tax today, knowing where hybrids are, electric vehicles, et cetera, we may not only have relied on just the gas tax, but we've done a different model on the gas tax than we have today. So how do we look at a long, when we look at a solution, we look at it from a long-term perspective so that we're gonna address this knowing that the problem is a five or 10 year, excuse me, 10, 15, 20 year problem. The solution we'll put forward will allow it to address it from a 10, 15, 20 year perspective. So I appreciate the committee's indulgence in looking at that and I'll get you a copy, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Representative Edwards. a quick question for Sharon and JP. By the way, you, you guys did a phenomenal job, and there's a tremendous amount of information here for us to digest over the next period until we have our next meeting. But um, when you talked about the funding gap that was created. Representative Edwards, I think there's a problem with your microphone. Um, I don't know if they can hear you, so I'll leave, leave my on, and Senator Arriwano, if you could leave yours on, maybe we could get the public to hear better. Thank you, Chairman. Um, here's a quick question on the funding gap that was discovered for the Rhode Island Turnbike and Bridge Authority. You mentioned that in 2007 they discovered they had a funding gap and they then increased the uh, tolls by 100% on the Newport Bridge. Um, when they did that, was that enough to, com to, to uh, close the gap or has the gap widened since then? And maybe the director will be able to supplement your information here, but that was a question I had on that. I, I can answer that. Is my mic my mic's on? Um, before I answer your question, Rep, um, certainly we as a group have a very daunting task. When I hear about the challenges that the DOT has, it, it is very, very, very daunting, and I'm always sympathetic to the good director. One of the things that the Turnpike and Bridge Authority has been fortunate, I think, to be able to do has been a little bit ahead of the curve because we have a dedicated revenue stream that has worked for us. Um, to respond to your question, that was the first increase we had ever had. It was the cash rate. The local rate actually went down. When we did it, we said that uh, there will be future increases. Um, we received more bonding, you know, we came to the legislature, we've moved forward. So I, I would have to look at the gap that, that you were referring to, but I, I think the Turnpike and Bridge has demonstrated an ability to manage our funds pretty well. And I, I think that our bridges have uh, uh, been pretty uh, safe. Uh, I would look at that 200 million. I don't know where the figure was from, JP. Good. Okay, thank you. Senator Arriwano. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, and I'd also congratulate you on, on really presenting a lot of data uh, very, very well. If, if I could, it's a fantastic overview. I'm going to ask a fairly specific question, if I could. And, and again, if the, the director, Mr. Chairman, if the director could chime in, if, if appropriate. 
Uh, with regard on page 35 of your presentation, the blue ribbon panel suggestions, you very, uh, you know, you perfectly pointed out that most of the recommendations from the blue ribbon panel had been instituted, but I, I'd like to get to just two questions about the two things that weren't done, just so I, I make sure I get my facts straight, you sort of coming out of the gates here. Um, obviously, we didn't toll Interstate 95, and increasing the gas tax has been debated mm -hmm. back and forth, and a, a lot of what I hear about the gas tax is, well, you got to be careful. You don't want to necessarily raise it too much. Everything, you know, everything in Rhode Island's a border town. What are you going to do to interstate commerce? But one of the slides you, you showed up mentioned the big discrepancy between Connecticut and Rhode Island, and I, and I started wondering, it's even bigger between Connecticut and Massachusetts with their border. So if you can make some comment about where, where you see raising the gas tax in the big process, is that something foolhardy economically? And, and secondly, if we could have a little commentary on what the potential for Interstate 95 is, is that something that's off the table? And or, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will defer to the department director on the 95 update. Uh, I'm sure he can summarize it better than I. On the, on the gas tax, the Connecticut rate, I mean, I don't know how much they compete with Massachusetts and how densely populated their border areas are. Um, the issue of border taxation uh, and differences of gas prices in Rhode Island and Massachusetts was raised at a hearing this spring, and we actually received a report from the Department of Transportation that attempted to address it, and they weren't able to conclude, you know, how much of the pricing was related to um, uh, the tax and in proximity to the border. It somewhat had to do with urban areas versus suburban. So there isn't a clear line. Uh, anecdotally, some of your colleagues will tell you, you know, I live on a border town. I mean, there have been some commissions that discuss it. Have we seen data definitively explaining that? No. Um, but I, I certainly wouldn't say it's not an issue. <laughs> so thank you very much. Senator, I'd like to, to touch on that as well. And I think that there's a there's a service done, and it's a, there's an online service that you could we can look at fuel prices across the country down to each zip code um, and, and municipality, I think. And it's a it, maybe we can get a hold of that for for a subsequent um, meeting because it's very interesting to show both nationally what fuel prices where they are, and then more regionally and then locally, and you'll see that. Um, Western and Southern Rhode Island fuel prices of the pump are very much influenced by Connecticut prices. Um, and as you get closer to um, the, the Providence area, more influenced by Massachusetts prices. So there are a lot of other factors that go into actually the price of the pump than the tax. Um, and you also see regions of the country. Um, and we're a fairly high overall, our region of the country, as is the Pacific Northwest and, and, and parts of California. Um, much of the Southeast all the way over through to Texas is is low relative to the rest of the country. So it's interesting, and that has to probably has to do with distribution costs and you know other things. But that, it, it's an interesting bit of data that I think would be valuable to the to the committee to look at. With regard to I-95, um, with one one minor um, uh, comment on how that was presented, Rhode Island wasn't actually denied tolling of I-95. Um, North Carolina was awarded an opportunity to toll 95. So um, we, a little bit on the, the, the federal law, it is, it is prohibited to toll an existing interstate by federal law. Going back to the previous legislation back into the 90s, I think it was under, say, uh, it was under T21, I think, or Ice-T it might be even, um, there were th pilot programs authorized under federal law to allow tolling under certain conditions. And there were three pilot slots available for states to apply to toll an existing interstate for purposes of reconstruction. Missouri was awarded one of those slots back in the early part of the last decade. Virginia was awarded one of those slots. Um, Virginia then requested it be changed from I-81 to I-95 and they were, that was authorized. The last slot was what Rhode Island put in a notice of interest, which is how their, the federal process worked, at the same time as Arizona and North Carolina. North Carolina was actually awarded that third slot. So as it stands today, the, 
there are no new slots. None of those three states have actually implemented the tolling of their interstates. Missouri's seeking to toll I-70. They haven't done it yet. Um, Virginia, I-95, they haven't done it yet. And North Carolina, I-95, they haven't done it yet. Um, so that's still an open question. The current federal law that passed last year, MAP-21, provided no opportunity to toll the interstates. So it's just the, what's left over from the old law that was still on the books. Okay. Now that is something that is deba still debated nationally. Um, there is a, um, a, a gentleman from the Reason Foundation, which was referred to earlier, who has a, a, a national paper on tolling all the interstates. So there is a there is it's still very much a matter that is a topic of discussion nationally um, but there are pros and cons to that thank you thank you mr chairman thank you i know representative edwards had a follow-up question if no, 95 i-95 I is actually told would that have to be transferred to the turnbrook and bridge authority or does the rhode island dot have the ability to toll or are you precluded by legislation from tolling anything uh, I w am I pre are we precluded? That's a good question. I think we'll have to look to the lawyers to see what the actual state law. We, we, we would use, we would at least be open to using the Turnpike and Bridge if that was approved, if the state wanted to go that route. Uh, there certainly only needs to be one toll collection agency in the state. So that would be something that we could um, work in agreement with the Turnpike and Bridge to actually be our collection agency. It doesn't have to be a, an asset of the, of the Turnpike and Bridge necessarily. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Just one of the Senator De Palma. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the comments regarding Connecticut. I believe Connecticut, like our gas tax, they have a gas tax, but I believe they also have, being from Connecticut, a value-added petroleum, or not value-added, they have a petroleum tax. On anything petroleum-based, they also tax, tax, which is why their gas tax is as high as it is. Not saying ours should be that high, but I believe it's a combination of both a gas tax and a petroleum product. So any petroleum product in the state of Connecticut is also apportioned or has a tax associated with it as well. Okay. Well, thank you. Any other questions, comments, suggestions? Um, I know we've received an awful lot of information today, um, and this book is probably two and a half inches thick, so we have an awful lot of reading to do. Um, at our next meeting, Sharon, uh, Senator DuPont brought up a good um, suggestion, and I was wondering, uh, is there any possibility we might be able to get someone from uh, nationally, from NCSL or some other organization that has been doing studies on this and maybe can come to a... a next presentation that we have you want the, the next meeting or the meeting after well uh, Any, if, a meeting a meeting if Absolutely. we can get someone to come up and give us a presentation of what their studies have been n nationally so we can kind of get an idea of what we're looking at and what we're looking up against yep there's a standing offer from ncsl to yeah to come to any state that needs this sort of expertise and certainly um, the person in charge there is, a, is, is an expert and can, can entertain your questions in a lot greater detail and pick apart some of the options you're thinking about. Maybe if, if I could uh, suggest if uh, maybe the staff could reach out to uh, NCSL and just in terms of uh, time availability uh, and once we get that uh, information we can reconnect and uh, within a three or four week depending again on their availability uh, time frame we can uh, then uh, with advance notice 